Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to be here. Uh, thank you for joining from near and far, joining our webinar, getting to know about Cropster Cafe. Um, we have gotten a lot of feedback after our latest show, which was SCA, on this latest product launch of ours that is targeted to cafe businesses uh, all over the world. And we thought it is a good idea to, you know, bridge the time between the next show of ours, which is World of Coffee, and give you a virtual chance to chime in and understand what Crop Street Cafe is about and, um, and ask questions and uh, see what our vision for this product is and how this may relate to your to your work and uh, challenges you may have. And it is my outright pleasure to welcome two fellow colleagues of mine um, that will, that are both very experienced in, um, in working in cafe businesses and with cafe businesses and in the industry in general, and therefore have a practical legitimacy to speak about certain workflows and things that um, can be observed in cafes all over the world. So uh, I wanna welcome my colleague, Eline, who is our uh, customer support manager for Crops to Cafe. And maybe Eline, you can just share a couple of words from about your experience, how you landed in, in specialty coffee, what excites you about it and uh, yeah, and sure thing. Why you why you arrived with Cropster? Uh, yeah, so thanks for that introduction. Um, I started working in specialty coffee basically as soon as I entered university, and it really started as this way of getting to know people and having something to do over the weekends and making some extra money. But like, I pretty much instantly fell in love with specialty coffee, and it kind of became this like big obsession, passion, and I worked in various cafes in the Netherlands and in Scotland throughout my whole time um, in my bachelor's degree and in my master's degree, and a little bit of time afterwards as well. Um, but I became super interested and curious about coffee outside of the cafe environment. So I came across Cropster, and long story short is I'm yeah now technical sports specialist for mostly Cropster Cafe, and it's my third week here at Cropster, end of the third week. It's all been super exciting and very new. I'm very happy to be here today. And so are we, we're super happy to have you on board. Um, I was stoked about your experience and how you were basically drawn like a magnet to our espresso <laughs> machine and all the things it can do and, and all the things you play with Cropster Cafe. So that's, that's awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, the next panelist, Isa, I do not have to introduce to many of our viewers. Um, many will know Isa from her work in the industry, but I let her fill in. Her role is product manager for Cropster Cafe. I believe Isa, you've been with us for four years and worked the coffee industry up and down. Maybe let our audience know a little bit about you and uh, where you come from and what you're aiming at. Sure. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, so my name's Isa, uh, and I've been in the coffee industry, the let's say wider coffee industry, since 2008. Um, same as how many people start in coffee, I uh, started as a barista, um, actually sort of picking up the coffee vibe uh, while I was uh, at the end of my sabbatical in New York, and I saw a lot of coffee culture there. Uh, people walking around with a cup and that intrigued me and as I moved back to Belgium where I'm from and where I currently live um, I was continuing with that search and I landed a job as a barista and uh, over the years uh, I've kind of gone through all the um, the, the sort of standard jobs the standard roles that you move through from a barista, then uh, a trainer, and then some wholesale account management and training. I did a month of roasting, I think, because that was not for me, um, which is also always good to recognize. Um, and then um, uh, continuing to sort of uh, cafe management. And I moved around quite a bit. Uh, I immediately started 
uh, volunteering at uh, World Coffee events, um, uh, also com competing in um, comp coffee competitions, barista competitions. And through that work, I kind of rolled into um, uh, getting to know people at uh, the Specialty Coffee Association when it was still the SCAE, so the, the separation there between the European and the um, American Association. And there I really um, uh, got the chance to uh, launch the Roasters Guild of Europe, the Barista Guild of Europe, and then further on um, work with the, um, the guilds in, in, in the world and also uh, set up the uh, Coffee Technicians Guild. And so really kind of use that opportunity to learn uh, and interact with a lot of the actors that um, are either directly in retail or sort of around it. Um, and that sort of experience then led me to uh, to Cropster and to what I do today um, is, is still sort of um, similar in terms of learning what the needs are of those different people and trying to um, bring that into a tool that can help and ease the workflows that, that the baristas and cafe managers um, deal with day in, day out. Um, and so, yeah, I, I landed uh, at Cropster about four years ago, and um, I'm, I'm super happy to finally have our uh, cafe product out in the world and to talk to you more about it today. Excellent. I think um, if there was any doubt, then uh, there shouldn't be any left um, how much perspective you can give to the product and the uh, insights that made their way into this into this uh, product from the many different stops you had in this exciting industry. Um, my name is Andy. I don't have uh, nearly as much uh, experience in the actual coffee industry as those two ladies. Actually, no formal one. Um, I am lucky that I have been working and continue to work for Cropster now. It's my 11th year. And um, I have learned a lot in this journey, on this journey with our customers, which is the approach that Cropster takes, that we listen to our customers and the industry to, um, to understand what is what are the challenges, what's needed next, right? What is the next exciting thing and, and prioritize those things and, and um, make them, turn them into solutions that um, have actual relevance. And today my position is um, global manager, uh, global sales manager of new products. And so let us, um, let me quickly shine some light on the agenda today. I mean, um, our goal is really to give everyone who's interested in Cropster Cafe an idea what it is, um, who is it for, what are the main challenges that we're tackling and just open the conversation and, and the dialogue and, um, and see if that is for you. We have uh, four main agenda points, and I've formulated them here as questions because really Alina, Isa, and I we will have a bit of a conversation here, and we will touch on those things. Um, the first question being, how can recipe sharing and updating be more efficient? So we will shed some light on what a recipe is, how it is being used today. Can this actually be easier? Um, and um, how does it look like in cafes um, uh, as we see them and as we've researched them? Then we will navigate into a very, I, I would say the most intriguing question. Uh, what can we know about brews that we serve to our customers? Uh, that is a, a big challenge and the industry and cafe businesses all over the world make huge efforts to narrow down error sources. And at the end of the day, there's still baristas serving beverage over beverage over beverage uh, over the counter and um, exciting customers. But the ability to understand them in their very, very detail may be more limited than um, we think. And then we will take a glance on operations. There are next to the exciting coffee creating, recipe creating, shot pulling, barista core tasks, there are things that just need to be in place in order to create a steady and good customer experience and make sure that um, operations can run smoothly. 
So we will take a look at that with a focus on equipment. And eventually we will um, discuss that um, gap that often occurs between roasting operations and barista. Um, gap sounds a bit negative, but that inability to communicate effectively based on facts between those two um, departments or operations. And let us begin with recipes. A quick light on what is a brew recipe. So I found this uh, photograph here and there is this ground coffee in those little uh, glass jars, which makes it look like a, a TV chef is about to create a, uh, a meal. And it's really similar, right? A recipe is a way of, uh, is a process, right? Is a way to take certain inputs and process them and come to a certain, to a certain result, food related. But what is it in relation to coffee? It can be anything from a very generic concept to a very specific best practice. And so maybe at Isa, I just open the table here and the conversation. When you think of a brew recipe, what, what is it for you? And what, what is the stretch that it can have in cafe business you have observed or that we have researched uh, when we worked for uh, on Cropster Cafe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's um, it, it it is very rightly put that it has some sort of leeway, and there are a few um, different ways at how um, different uh, coffee coffee businesses look at a recipe. And if I think also back at my time, um, sort of managing a cafe um, and how we went about it there as well, it's you have your basic brew recipe meaning the high level sort of standards that you use in your um in your business throughout your your different locations that is it's almost more like a beverage recipe it's a drinks recipe our espressos are always going to be using roughly these um parameters that's sort of the most high level um aspect there and that's usually uh, again set across the business um how, of course, in specialty coffee, we also are aiming to get the best out of each coffee. And we know that each coffee can have um, different characteristics sort of intrinsic to the bean. And how do we bring them out? And how do we let them shine um, and sort of bring out all of the, the work and that all of the previous actors in the supply chain have done? Um, and that's where we definitely need to go a bit, a, a bit more specific. In there, it's a trial and error process. But when we say, what is the brew recipe for this coffee? Then for sure, um, there's, there's more detail. There's more granularity um, with the different uh, variables and per parameters. In my case, um, this was something that was mostly set by the head barista um, who would get a new coffee and who would uh, experiment and um, and um, create that brew recipe. But then, of course, if we take it one level further, there's also the day-to-day -day, um, changes that need to happen when you dial in in the morning. We have this practice in, um, in specialty coffee to really adapt the key recipe for this coffee to the setting that you're in. And that could be um, the specific equipment that you have, the specific water that you have, um, also just the environment, um, whether your grinder has already uh, heated up a little bit through the day that may require small adjustments. And so also that I think is what um, people call, what, if you walk in as a barista for your next shift, you'll ask your colleagues, hey, what's the recipe? And there you really want to know what are we brewing? How are we brewing this coffee right now in this mm -hmm. moment in time? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of differences or different levels of granularity. And also I think different needs for different actors in your business to know these, um, these parameters. Mm -hmm. Alina, how has this, how has this, how does this resonate with your past experience? Have you been say more in the process of original creation of this basic recipe as Isa describes it, um, or is it more, and that's what I imagine it to be, 
part of that dialing process to refine it every day? And how did you work with recipes there? Um, in most of the cafes I've worked at, it's been like I've been part of the process of getting the coffee to taste like the, the espresso on a single day to taste good. So it's like those small changes that you're making to a baseline recipe. Um, I've also been part of like developing a recipe for a new coffee that comes in, which is like often we would use a baseline and then see what happens. And like Isa said, it's then trial and error and trying to figure out what do you taste and what can what do you want to change? What do you want to enhance? Um, so that's part of the, the recipe development part that I've been in and handing that over to your coworkers when they come in, when you leave your shifts um, or receiving that information and knowing what to do with it. So it's been a little bit of, of, of both, I guess, on, on my end of like being part of the development of a new recipe or making those little tweaks throughout the day. Okay, yeah, excellent. And I think this is, um, this resonates or is true for many baristas um, all over uh, the world that there is, um, you know, what may start with a careful introduction into how to use recipe will then evolve into more and more uh, power and trust to update them over time, uh, which leads me to uh, my next question. So um, recipes should become a best practice for a certain thing in a certain setting, as Isa described it with, you know, water equipment and grinder, um, status, so to say. And so this photo um, may resonate with many, or this is at least what we have seen in many places, that um, recipes often exist in such or similar form that they have been, you know, put on a laminated sheet of paper, on the grinder, or next to the brewing device, whatever this may be. Um, and then there is, you know, it um, only has so and so much power to be updated and brought back into the business. Um, <clears throat> Isa, when you, when we have researched for Cropster Cafe, um, we have seen laminated sheets. We've also seen other tools. What have our, our customers and contacts reported to be the challenging part when using such a system? Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, maybe first starting with the um, the upside or the beauty of this, of course, we know it is easy, right? We've seen, I've worked with post-it notes instead of these um, laminated sheets, but just small post-it notes or with a marker. Um, and of course that um, the, the beauty of it is that it happens really quickly and you just jot it down. And we know that that's um, that that's something that is of importance for baristas that they have a lot of things going on. And so it needs to be um, simple and easy. Now, the feedback that um, when you, when I dig in a little bit further with uh, customers that we talk to uh, in developing the product um, is of course that there, this is something that stays in the, cafe it is localized to one location and even to one shift or one barista and there is not much um transparency to, between different locations therefore there's also not much learning possibility between peers between um uh different uh locations of of, of a business as well as there's not any transparency and learning for um, people that I kind of like to call in one group back of house, meaning um, anyone that is not always permanently working um, uh, as a barista, but it has more the role of cafe manager or a trainer, educator um, that need to manage and maintain quality across the business. And they don't get to see any of this information unless they physically visit each of the cafes. And mm -hmm. of course, you kind of already hear me coming. That's another challenge because that's very costly um, to, to have to go to the different locations without also having any info whether do they need any help? Is this just a standard QC procedure that, that of course is fine and happens, but you don't have any um, sort of focus as to well, this location may need a little bit more help. And so 
I think those are kind of key things there between one, the learning that happens even just among peers and people having to kind of repeat the same mistakes in trying to find a good uh, recipe. Um, mm -hmm. And so those were definitely a few of the things that came up uh, repeatedly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eline, from your personal experience as a barista, um, what what did you use and does this resonate with you what Isa says that you know there could have been ways to um, let back office or uh, back of house as Isa describes it know about where you stand with it and and maybe just just share a couple of insights or things that you can yeah so um, most in most cafes I've worked at we've like Isa said um, you sticky notes um, if that was like, this is the recipe that we're using today for the espresso and this is the this is the uh, Clever Drip or B60 and this is the batch brew. Um, so then it was often sticky notes. Uh, we also use a notebook. Um, maybe it was like a calendar as well where you could go back and find the dates. Like this was the recipe then. Um, if we were like sharing recipes for new beans that were coming in or um, if we were sharing a process of how you got to the decision if, if for, for a certain recipe then you would communicate that either through you know, WhatsApp chat group or verbally, and then have to use whatever brain power you have to, to remember everything. Um, but yeah, I think what Isa says resonates quite a lot. Like sometimes you would be trying to figure out a recipe for something and then you'd try different things and then talk to someone else and they'd be like, oh, I've already tried that. And it's like, okay, well, I guess there, if there's no way to know about that, then it gets sort of challenging and you waste coffee sometimes and um, yeah, it's just, it takes up quite more, quite a lot more time than it necessarily should. Um, also like once you, if you lose a piece of paper then that's your recipe gone. So then, you know, you have to find different ways of trying to find that back and communicate with people. So there's definitely a few blockers there with um, keeping everything analog and written on paper and on, on sticky notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah. Tying back to what Isa said, um, it has to be it has to be simple, right? And so that is why sticky notes exist, and they have their legitimacy, right? Paper is quick and it creates some information, but um, it it often lives, but also it dies often right there. And uh, the example that you raised, like you know, when you when you exchange with your peers, and then they say, "Yeah, I already tried that." I mean, trial, trial and error is great and is encouraged, but if there are, um, if the business can learn faster from errors, I think everybody, ben <coughs> excuse me, benefits. <clears throat> um, and definitely the, the wastage of coffee <coughs> should also um, go down in, in that process. So using that feedback of our customer and our research, <coughs> we think it can be easier to get recipes where they are needed. And um, our approach is from giving um, back of house or say a head barista, a bar manager, or um, tools to create recipes in a simple way that cover the same things as a laminated sheet or post-it and get them where it's needed, but then also give bar staff the power to update them. And so our approach um, follows a line of um, making it as simple as possible to create recipes. And um, depending on the brewing method, depending on the goals and the setting and the approach of the business, this may differ. Now, luckily software makes it easy to adjust uh, points of interest, so to say. And uh, here's an example that shows how recipes can be created um, out of an iPad, a phone, uh, a desktop from anyone that the business deems to be good to be in charge. And uh, this can start from general data points like those and yield and, and target brew time, um, descriptors that can come from a recommendation out of the roastery or from the QC lab um, down to the, the most minutia. And um, in order to skip the, I would say, 
um, not ideal use of time to, you know, do calls and chats to get this recipe that is the baseline for a certain coffee onto locations uh, in our software. Um, you can simply select the locations that this coffee is being used at for this particular brewing method, and uh, it will then appear for the people in charge there. So it's kind of like handing that post-it note over virtually um, from anywhere. And um, instead of sticking it there, it is in the pockets of, of people or when there is a point of sale system that people can pull out their iPad and, and view it from there as a baseline. What we've heard, um, it's, it's a point to get started, but there is this a localized setting of equipment and um, you know the batch that is being used and, and the environment and the water and many things. So these recipes, this post-it um, appears in a digital way there and um, whoever we'd like to can have the power to update it locally with throughout the dialing process. And tying back to the example of what Elina said, this I already tried that um, can then be tracked without any further ado, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't change the actual process, only the vehicle with which we do it um, is different. So in our system, you would then simply use the log functionality or our um, integrated um, logging tools for certain equipment to pick a brew or create a brew that is the local ideal for this specific setup on this particular time. And our system, of course, learns this and tracks this over time so that there is a history um, across the business where anyone of, I would say, who wants to be the, um, I would say the gatekeeper or has an interest in how recipes are being used can see how they're being used in which location and what the actual results are. So in my example here, I have six locations and there is one recipe being used for espresso, but there are local alterations and um, there are always tools to enrich data points with extraction, with flavor notes to help anyone in the business understand from the input, what is the actual result and how, how we got there. And so, to show you all real quick how this works. I have a, a quick video run through how to add a recipe. It starts by very generic um, data points like you know the name of the coffee, what the brewing method is, where it comes from, variety, all of this is optional, just to give a rough orientation. And then one can input what is of interest in my uh, example here, I've limited it to the most key data points of those yields, um, brew time, but I also added a getting started grind setting, which can be um, helpful or not, and uh, target flavor descriptors, and it will then turn into a reference for this recipe, and I immediately select where I else want to show this as this, you know, as Isa said, this rough guideline to begin with, it immediately appears on my overview. So the post-its are handed out now, okay? And I know this, and now we change hats and we become a barista real quick. And I can see as a barista, when I come on, that there is a new recipe uh, that helps me get going in the uh, dial-in process. And yes, it's 18 grams in, but if I figure out in the process, no, I actually want to change um, a, a target yield of 37 and a different brew time um, kind of like uh, gets out more of the potential of the coffee, then I'm good to enter this information and update the reference locally. And so we hope, we believe that this way we kind of we are digital post-its, we are digital um, laminated sheets, uh, only that the learning can happen much faster and the trial and error is cuts down and, um, and everybody can, um, can learn from it more quickly. And so here you see how the eventual reference was updated. <clears throat> okay, now um, 
let us move on. Let us move into uh, the next step. So what we have now is a is a recipe. We have this guideline. We have this this help of um, how to go about with a coffee in a certain setting. Um, but then the challenge remains that we cannot. Sorry, just need to. The challenge remains that we want to pull this off consistently, right? So there is um, only because we have a recipe, we don't know that the eventual result will be just that. And if we know one thing, we know that there are so many things that can change during a day that even if the process is the same, uh, the result may vary. And so I want to open that question. We had a, a webinar not too long ago, um, where we raised the same question for roast consistency, and it is an ambiguous concept. Um, consistency ties around what is quality, um, who determines what is quality, how do we maintain it, and what do we have to maintain? But I think I just want to throw the ball back at the two experts here in this panel. If you think of brew consistency, and maybe I can start with you, Elena, what what is it for you? Is it a certain flavor? Is it a certain appearance? Is it a certain process? When you think of brew consistency, what, what is it for you? I mean, it incorporates all of the things that you just said, but I think when I think about it as a barista, um, I'm trying to get the quality of the shots that I'm pulling throughout the whole day to be within a range that I've sort of previously decided on based on testing and, and tasting what those coffees taste like within that range um, and deciding on this, this is it. And th the coffees within this range, I find good and ready to serve and knowing sort of what changes to make when to keep that sort of constant throughout the whole day. So like what Isa said earlier about, for, for example, your, your burr temperature changing throughout the day. So you're, when you're dialing in in the morning, your burrs are quite cold so your dial is going to evolve throughout the day. Um, and if you weren't to change anything, then your brew consistency would suffer as a result. So if, uh, for example, after a rush, your, your burrs are then much hotter. Um, you, you'll only know the quality of your shots when you're tasting and tracking and kind of just serving the shots that are within that range that you've kind of decided on this is, this is good. Um, mm -hmm. Keeping that constant throughout the whole day. I would say that's what I would sort of define brew consistency as. Mm -hmm. And um, in your in your um, the, in the approach that you had or in your line of work, um, would how would you how would you judge that something is consistent or that something is different? Is that a matter of tasting? Is that a matter of process adjustment? Um, I think when you're pulling a shot, um, you need to pay close attention to how it's extracting. So for like, you need to keep an eye on all of the basic things, like for example, just dose in time yield. Um, those are like the three basic things that I was always keep an eye on and try to keep them as constant as possible. Um, then like, obviously your, your grind settings have a really big impact on that. So keeping that in mind. Um, visually the way that your coffee looks while it while it's extracting like if you can if you see it channeling all, all over the place you know that that's not what you want and like you said the color um, you know you, you want to keep an eye on is it not browning to, or blonding too quickly or is it um, is it super dark how quickly is your coffee coming out or how slowly um, and yeah, also obviously a really important one is flavor, like keeping that consistently good throughout the whole day and at a within that range that I was that I mentioned previously, um, that it's within sort of that standard of quality that you've that you want to serve to your customers. So those those are important pointers. Mm -hmm. Isa, from from your perspective, when you talk to our customers or when we researched a topic, what were what were pointers that um, that uh, people, baristas, cafe owners, bar managers gave us when they talked about the concept of brew consistency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, 
I think there is sort of this difference between depending on who we spoke to and what role they have in the business. Um, and I think for uh, Barista, like uh, Elena said, that that definitely is in line there with you know wanting to monitor um, the shots as they are being pulled and um, trying to monitor the sort of key parameters and paying close attention and keeping that in in range. Um, but I think there's sort of a uh, somewhat different perspective when it comes to um, what cafe managers are are looking for. Because for them, ultimately, uh, I think that the way that we that we want that they perceive consistency is that they want to ensure that the coffee um, is tasting good, regardless of who made it and regardless of where it was made. So that is brewed to sort of the same um, uh, standards or the same, you know, that it's optimally tasting. I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think in recipe development, we try to create a recipe that brings out the best flavor. And I think in consistent consistency, we're trying to maintain that best optimal recipe. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, but 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 the reason why that is so important, and I, and I think that is um, uh, an important point to touch on today as well. That is really because um, again, you want your customers to have a good experience in each of the places where your coffee is served. And I think that is where sort of the concern comes in because it's not just, and, and, and actually this is also in my, I used to work, uh, this was quite early on in, uh, in my career when I was working as a barista um, and we had less tools to monitor um those shots and we didn't use scales yet when i started right we we would just um we would trust the grinder to be delivering a consistent dose and we would eyeball the volume coming out it, as you say Aline, we would look at blonding for example but and we didn't have a lot of tools and in that um era and i had uh experience like customers that were coming in and wanting a coffee only made by their favorite barista and mm -hmm. not wanting it when it was made by anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that you're, that is really something you're trying to avoid um, uh, as, as a cafe manager, as, as a, a, an educator, because not only obviously does it create rivalry in, in your team and it, do, it doesn't create a good culture in your team, but also, um, it, it hurts your business. Uh, if that person isn't on bar at that point, then that customer isn't going to order the coffee that they actually came in for. for, for, um, for. And so um, I think it's this sort of more conceptual idea of like making sure that each customer, no matter whether they go in location one or location two, no matter it's barista one or barista two, like they have the same taste experience and of course customer service is an important aspect there as well but when it comes to the consistency of the coffee like they have the same experience um uh, in each of these instances um mm -hmm. and i think it's sort of circling back to um how do we achieve that uh, that's where then this monitoring comes in right um i see you have uh, you know, on the slides, what do we know about our brews? And I think that's where what we know about the brews is the cues, the moments that we are tasting our espresso. And that's where we say, okay, this is what I want to achieve. But we do not taste each coffee that goes out. On the contrary, the majority of the coffees we are not tasting. We can't taste the espressos that we use in our beverages. And so how do we know that they are not slowly drifting? How do we know that we bring them back? Like, as, as Alina said, that it's getting busy. Um, you, you start to maybe see, you, you already as a barista need to have sort of constant focus on your shots and you see that things may be drifting, but it's super busy. There's another five customers waiting. I'm gonna finish. I think I think this is quite familiar uh, for people. 
uh, listening in. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this line first so that everyone has their coffee, and then I have some time to maybe readjust my grinder and to taste again. And so I think um, we don't know enough in terms of that when that moment happened and whether we were in time in kind of bringing it back. And and that's really I think a, a big problem in. Um, sort of the, the monitoring of uh, the espresso shots and trying to be consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all, all of this is very, um, is very true. I believe, um, you know, particularly the fact that the tasting part, we, we cannot do to the extent that we wish to do. First, it is um, impossible in the moment, but it's also, you know, the uh, operations need to keep up, right? And what I've heard from the two of you is there is different perspectives on consistency from a barista point of view and from a manager's point of view with um, consistency in the moment, in the work environment of what can I monitor, what can I do, what can I uh, narrow down, what can I keep constant, right? What, what can I leave as is but which things do I have to monitor? And then there is, you said, eyeballing, you know, you look at how fast the shot runs through on, on the color of it, um, it tastes here and there, uh, certain adjustments of things that you may want to change based on experience. Um, but then there is this other view on it, which is the manager who um, would just like every coffee to be at the same quality all the time and avoid this case that Isa mentioned of my favorite barista or people preferring to go into one location which is already super busy and not going to the other um, or that inability to transfer that knowledge between the two to be able to balance that out um, let alone if there is different equipment so then things get increasingly more, more and more complex. So from us at Cropster that we come from a, well, a word on software uh, in general, um, it is important to make data collection easy uh, in order to begin to understand and organize information and learn from it. And so, um, our idea behind brew consistency is one, well, as we cannot taste every coffee and as we should not taste every coffee, what can we constantly track and monitor in a simple and organized way in order to get a little bit rid of the guesswork of what can I have constant? What do I need to change um, based on which equipment? And the more variables I add to this game, the more complex it will become. And so the goal of cafe managers and owners will mostly or often be a certain growth in quality or in, or in size or in locations or in customer happiness. Um, we just hope to create um, facts by tracking certain aspects of the brew and create an automated understanding of how coffees are being pulled so that we can focus on the things that we, we may want to change. And so that we can focus on when we taste that we can add that information. Or as Alina says, to make sure that it extracts well, that we can focus on not watching how the coffee runs through, but then you know measure TDS and extraction every once in a while to have those milestones that um, narrow down how variant our um, our uh, coffees can be and to make this tighter and tighter and tighter with every data point that we understand. And so what you see here is basically a symbol for our automated hands-free brew tracking that we are uh, working on and constantly evolving um, where I as a barista, as a cafe owner, as a head barista, as a trainer, can rely on the fact that all brews are collected um, by the group head, by the recipe, um, with all the data points that I get from the machine at all times, being able to enrich this information as and when um, I should and when there are important um, times in the day where I should do so. 
The way we do that is very simple. So we have uh, recently launched an integration with our partners, uh, Lamar Zocco, to be able to tie into their IoT line of machinery, which means basically we are able to capture upon integration the brew data that is coming from that machine. It's relatively easy to set up. And the cool thing, or what I like the most is for the barista, nothing changes because we heard about the busyness of a, a barista and that is not news to any barista out there. So it has to work in the background with any, uh, without any manual intervention. And so our approach is one where we can basically tie any uh, button of the machine that is operated by the barista to a recipe, which is called Hairbender here in my case. And, um, you know, um, tie the buttons, the single shot buttons of group two, for example, to Hairbender. And then the rest is that automatic data collection, which is what we as software providers are, um, are aiming at to make that simple. And it automatically, as I phrased it here, we give all brews a home because there is no more need to tag and categorize and track afterwards. Our system basically creates this library of brews by the group hats, the, um, the button that was pressed, the recipe, um, all the information, all the input information from the recipe, we can carry over from what we have created before, what we talked about in the previous section, everything that we get from the machine, like brew water volume, temperatures, yield if there are built-in scales, brew time, we get um, automatic. And um, one very common use case is that, you know, brew time may accelerate as, you know, grinders heat up. Now, and this is just one thing where we put all the facts there to help um, baristas, managers to understand that and cushion that and, and, and jump in time ahead, tied up with the ability to add data points at all times. So say throughout the day when I'm busy, I may just wanna track um, the regularity of the brews and track you know the data coming from the machine, but when the coffee changes, when the roast batch changes, when the shift changes or other things occur, I may just want to add, you know, I may just want to taste that coffee in between and add flavor notes and put in assurance that it does still taste the way it's supposed to taste and, and track TDS and extraction or um, even tie it to the roast batch in order to be uh, responsive of how um, fresh or stale the coffee may be that I'm using. And so I will skip this video for the sake of time because the result is um, the result of this seamless data tracking. Uh, and that is, the, that is the comfort and the luxury of software is we can then focus on organizing it and making it visual and comprehensive for anyone who's interested in, well, how narrow are we, right? How consistent do we operate? And if and when I, 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 I leeway, if and when there is something off, I would just want to know. And I would want to know what the source may be, sources which can be manifold. So in my report here, the consistency report, um, I have three machines symbolized by color, okay? and. Um, the narrower each graph is, the more consistent uh, the brews are. And so as a negative example, or as an example that may call up my attention, I have uh, this um, on this machine on this particular Sunday, I had way more outliers symbolized by the dots here than on other days. And so there may be different reasons for it. Um, the difference that it makes is, First, we turn an unknown unknown into a known unknown. So before I might just have hand, as symbolized by that photo, I might just have handed out coffees and um, trusted in my ability to create that coffee based on the things that I know. We all know coffee is delicate and so is the equipment and so is every day. 
And with this tool, it is just easy to highlight pointers that something is off. And from here, it is just then very easy to go into the day, look into the bruise that occurred and, um, and see, does it have to do with the equipment? Um, did, did I use a different roast batch? Who was, who was in charge that day? Who was brewing those coffees or whatever it may be, but it just narrows those things down and it, also gives managers, owners a tool to um, learn from and across locations, right? Because that is eventually what we want, that, oh, my favorite barista thing, for as charming as it sounds, it, um, it works against redundancy and the ability to produce the same customer experience across locations. And so with this, we are hoping to, um, uh, yeah, add more facts to, the game. Good. Now, um, we've spoken a lot about quality and consistency, which is surely for everyone from the specialty coffee industry, the, the most exciting part. But we all know very well that in, um, in any cafe, in coffee bars, uh, particularly in specialty, there are things that are part of every day that need to be taken care of in order for operations to run smoothly. And I think there is like this general rule, you know, the, the, the better the coffee, um, the more we will want to take care that we don't lose quality along the way. And we should never forget that coffee when it arrives in the cafe has had a very long journey already in the beginning of which there has been uh, a producer, first of all, that lives um, off it and, and buy it, um, but also so many steps in between. And um, at the end, there is equipment that we use to brew coffee, to make it delicious, to make it delicious over and over again. But um, this, this equipment is often literally under pressure through, you know, a lot of traffic, water, coffee grounds, um, and the many, many other things that can go wrong. So um, again, playing the ball back to our experts, um, when, when we speak about coffee equipment, and if you resonate, think about nostalgically about the days in a cafe, um, what does it what does it all entail and how how have you perceived it have you had examples where um equipment has let you down or was the source of inconsistencies um maybe i don't know who wants to start first of you i can give some examples mm -hmm. <laughs> um so i think starting with like the general equipment maintenance tasks. So like the biggest ones are obviously your espresso machine and then your, your grinders. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll start with the grinder because I feel like I have, a, I have an example of when we were experiencing a lot of inconsistencies with like a grind by weight, for example, where it would be output. It would say it's, it's um, producing 18.5 grams, but it, it wasn't always. Um, and so we implemented a best practice to just always, every single day, clean the burrs, um, not just do it like on a bi-weekly or a weekly basis, but do it every single day after the end of a shift. So you take off the hopper, unscrew everything, take the burrs out, give them a good clean. And um, it improved consistency massively. Um, also, I, I, you know, it's obviously just, it's gonna be better for your, your burrs at the end of the day. Um, that they've got beans passing through them uh, endlessly and you know beans are oily and little bits get left behind so that was just it it really did make a difference for us once we started doing that every single day and then with your espresso machine I think for every cafe I've worked at it was like a, a given that you would take out uh, the shower screens and give them a good good clean take out the baskets clean the portafilters do the group heads back flush throughout the day back flush at the end of the day with cafes. Um, I think that's for, for most baristas quite like basic espresso machine cleaning. Um, but if it's not done, I've, I haven't seen this, but I've heard of horror stories where like this layer of like oily mold starts forming in the, in the shower screens. And that's obviously gonna impact the longevity of your machine. 
um, mm. but also the the flavor of your coffee. I mm. mean, it's not going to improve by that, and it's a health and safety mm. for sure. So um, yeah, crucial stuff to do that every single day. They can get quite dirty after a busy shift. So um, yeah, those are the two biggest biggest sort of equipment cleaning tasks that that I would go through basically on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that, as you say, have um, when changed, when altered, um, had a massive impact on consistency as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Isa, I think I will halfway already lead into um, the Cropster Cafe idea behind that. So I like I like the recipes, we, particularly you, have seen how tasks are being managed or equipment has been, is being managed in, um, in cafes all, uh, all over. Now, it, um, equipment is, I think it cannot, be, it cannot be underestimated how important it is to watch out for it. First, you know, the, the examples that Alina raises, um, that certain caretaking, certain habits may just have a very positive impact on the quality consistency. Now, if I flip that over, the absence of these may have an impact on consistency on the downward spiral. And the sad thing will be, you will often not notice or not being able to attribute it to those things until you try otherwise. Um, in the worst case, um, however, or most importantly, an espresso machine, a grinder, is the basis to make revenue. We should not forget about that, right? So uh, an absolute breakdown of these machines or inability to produce um, has, has a big impact. So what are, what are we seeing? What have you seen with, in our research, um, how this is being managed today? Um, what, is, what is our customers' feedback on it? Um, just any insights mm -hmm. be very appreciated. Sure. Um, I think uh, here again, there's sort of two aspects um, that have come back um, repeatedly. And so one is um, kind of as you were leading on to it, sort of the, uh, everyone wants to avoid downtime on their equipment. A coffee shop literally lives by still predominantly the espresso machine. I, of course, also um, the other key pieces of equipment like a, a batch brewer are important, but I think in terms of number of, um, of coffees being sold, I think in most businesses, it's still predominantly uh, espresso. And so imagine an hour of downtime. That is not only the, of course, the cost of getting someone in to look at what the problem is if you cannot immediately troubleshoot or fix it yourself. But that, and so that is of course also the lost revenue of that hour and the lost uh, number of coffees that you were not able to sell. But in addition to that, it also means that in that moment, the customers that were coming to you for a cup of coffee are still needing that cup of coffee and they will go around the corner for that cup of coffee. Um, if you're lucky, then around the corner may not be as good as what you're serving and that customer will come back to you the next day. But if you're unlucky, that customer has just found their new coffee shop that they will frequent every day. And so you risk losing a customer. So I, I, I cannot, stress almost the importance of enough of avoiding downtime right and that's that's where of course um that comes in in terms of really needing to enforce and i, I think as a cafe manager uh, and and as elena has said it it is such a critical aspect of your business that it has to become a standard that has to be done every day um but the, the, the cleaning tasks vary a little bit. And so, um, of course, there's still a need for training people on them, but there's also a need for um, ensuring that those tasks are done. And that's where the second aspect that I've heard a lot comes in. And that's 
one that I've also experienced um, when I was managing a cafe is sort of the communications around tasks mm -hmm. and the time that you spent on just checking in whether things have actually been done. Um, for example, um, I would often, when I was managing, I would maybe leave a post-it note for someone the next day with things that they had to do that I saw that hadn't been done. And then you leave that post-it note and the next day, I don't know what happened with that post-it note. Did the barista see my post-it note? Did they actually do what was on the post-it note? And so I would have to spend time to check in again to, um, to ensure that they had seen it and that the task was done. Um, and, and so all of that, of course, I, we also heard through the research that, that there's a lot of um, businesses that manage this through um, uh, WhatsApp groups or Slack conversations, sort of group, group um, communication tools that have improved a lot. Um, but I also hear that that's um, not always great because there's baristas that have no, you, you kind of disturb your staff unnecessarily there's a, a number maybe staff that isn't working that day um uh maybe um they weren't involved with it at all they don't know and so you disturb the ones that cannot help you um and uh, at the same time it also kind of creates a little bit of an, an um, anonymity and um you're not addressing the the problem directly or um you're you're not being informed by the people that have to inform you. And so um, I think those those kind of two things combined really created um, or, or what I distilled out of all of that information and research was really the need to, um, to have an easy way to disseminate tasks across the business. And um, there's, you know, checklists, as you said, you have your all the other things that need to be done. It isn't just about maintaining your equipment. There's open and closing checklists um, and they're repetitive every day and um, just an easy way to disseminate that. But again, also an easy way to um, have oversight and insight whether those things have been done without the need to bother or bug your staff for it. Um, mm, and yeah. so that's, that's really where I think um, uh, Crops or Cafe comes in with a with a solution for those problems. Yeah, that's right. And um, I think you mentioned a, a couple of good points. Um, so I think everybody in, in specialty coffee or like the the at the heart there is you know passionate baristas that you know that join the specialty coffee business and learn that there is something beyond an average coffee and that there is a farmer behind it and there is outstanding quality that I can emphasize that is not just, you know, determined by mild flavor, but um, can be very exciting, but therefore is also very delicate and hard to achieve. And so there we have no problem. I believe there's so much passion and so much uh, love and, and so much um, interest in uh, understanding this and sometimes I just feel like on a more philosophical aspect that there is um, uh, I would say this, this sheer um, fact that we're talking about equipment here or things like you know certain cleaning tasks or um, you know restocking certain things or, or, or preparing tables or everything all of these small things just contribute to forwarding that um, quality and that story of the original specialty coffee to the customer that we want to excite over and over again. And always, there's always a negative example. The not doing of those things may just result in problems that we do not even see firsthand. Like you said, Isa, people may just go to the cafe around the corner, but they don't send you a message that they do so. And so that, um, Going back to the post-it note here, symbolized by the by the um, clipboard um, on on the slide here, there's there's so many things. Um, you know, opening the cafe in the morning, you know, preparing all the things, um, setting setting up um, 
the batch brewer, setting up the manual brew re recipes, um, tasting those things, um, cleaning, putting up pastry. I mean, things that we haven't even touched on that is coffee unrelated, but super, super vital to, to have in place. And then beginning the dial-in process and, and um, uh, ensuring that the machines, plural, operate smoothly. And then needless to say, throughout the day of the caretaking, it has to happen. And then more particularly at the end of each day where uh, many machine related cleaning and maintenance tasks are due in order to make sure that the next day can occur and repeat that experience. And I think um, what we're talking about here is habits. And um, yes, it's the same analogy to recipes. Uh, yes, the clipboard is fast. Yes, I posted it fast. But tying into your analogy, um, Isa, do you know if it has been done when you leave a posted note? No, you don't. And less so does you know, the next one or a manager. And so um, with Crops to Cafe, we basically doubled down on the approach of sharing things from a um, central place to locations and people uh, related to tasks. And we, instead of those post-it notes, we um, make it so that tasks can be created in any shape or form. They are cafe specific in the sense of I can tie them to equipment, I can tie them to uh, baristas, I can tie them to locations. But also what we do know is in cafes, there are many, many, many repetitive tasks that follow a different rhythm. And this is where usually the systems that we have seen do break because um, why would I enter in an Excel sheet or on a post-it notes to backflush the machine every day, uh, but change the gaskets um, quarterly <clears throat> to say something. And so um, we've built that in alongside those things to you know, help empower the bar teams because I think it's in everyone's interest to maintain uh, equipment and a smooth process. Um, is it the most exciting part of the job? No. And therefore making it easier is very important because it is crucial regardless. And so um, there is always this dual view on Cropster here symbolized by the desktop where a bar manager can create and send out tasks to um, individual locations. And in the very instance, they appear on the phone, on the tablet of a barista who, by the way, we do not wanna um, distract too much, but in the beginning of a day, at the end of the day, it is okay to pull out a device and check what is due to be done today. Um, we highlight the coffee equipment, cleaning, customer experience related uh, tasks for them, show potentially what is overdue or what needs some extra attention, um, what has to be done the next seven days. These things can be marked off relatively easily. They can share a comment which would then appear again on this um, back of house um, overview. And therefore, we create accountability for a barista in the most positive sense of the word, right? That they um, have an intuitive tool that shows them in an easy way what needs to be done. It helps them form a habit on behalf of the quality and, um, and a bar manager will begin to understand when things have been done, how they have been done. It creates a track log by four expensive equipment like grinders and espresso machines of how did I take care of this over time. And here I could easily pull out the consistency report again from beforehand where I can then understand, okay, if I do have quality inconsistencies, does it have to do because in this particular location, someone did not backflush the machine regularly, okay? And so it, again, we, um, we don't do anything different that is already in place. We only make it faster and more efficient and effective and more easier to follow through and to learn uh, for the entire business. Now, looking at my uh, clock here, my invisible one, visible one, um, I will skip that next video, which shows how to create tasks, but it's so easy that it will only take us um, 32 seconds. 
So um, let us move on to our last topic. And before I do so, um, I should have mentioned this beforehand. Now everybody can, of course, uh, submit and send in questions through the chat window. So uh, if you've come across any thoughts, please um, send them in. And, and if it's not right now, we're, of course, available later. Um, this fourth aspect, I would just like to spend a little bit of time on, despite it being um, important. Um, extraction to start with. So whether you are a roaster retailer or whether you are just, quote unquote, a cafe business that uh, is being supplied to from an external roastery, there is always a new coffee. There is always a certain change. There is always a, uh, a little extra that you will need to understand about the roast before or when you are um, dialing in that coffee or when you wanna improve it, going back to what Alina said, this trial and error process. So at the end of the day, it comes down to how many variables can I understand in order to get quicker to where I want to be. So maybe um, in a few words with a short example, uh, Eline, you as a barista, when you received a new coffee, I'm guessing you were handed a bag with certain information on it. Mm -hmm. What did you do with it? Did you wish you knew more and why and how would it have helped you? So basically with the information that you get on a bag, you're, already, you're, you're told, you're given sort of an indication of how, of, of how the coffee is going to taste. And mostly, you know, often it will say if it's a filter, an espresso roast, some roasteries will just even say light, medium, uh, words like that, and then have flavor descriptors. Um, and those are all really good indications for the type of brew that you're going to be making. So, um, you know, if it's like a dark chocolate, caramely nutty one, that to me already says espresso. If it's like a fruity, boozy, natural one, like best bet is filter. And that's not a rule, but uh, that's kind of what I would gravitate towards. Um, and so that, I would take the information on, on the bag. Um, but I have had also instances where you, you get a really tricky bean and it's very difficult to extract both as a filter and as an espresso. And at that point, I think getting feedback from the roaster sometimes is, um, you know, because they've cupped the coffee and they, they've been with it, you know, they've roasted it. They will, you know, might have a really good tip for you or an idea for how they envisioned this coffee and um yeah i think feedback from from the roaster in that sense uh can can be nice uh, to give you an indication of how to best brew brew the coffee mm -hmm. yeah and um i will cut a little bit short here because if um Cropster is known for our roasting solutions and so it was only a natural progression that we Mary uh, Cropster Cafe with Cropster Roast. Mary in the sense of as an add-on if you want to, if you're a cafe businesses and don't use Cropster Roast, it's also fine. Um, but we thought that's another, that's another bird that we can add to our one shot. And um, so using Alina's uh, example, we make it very simple for, a, for baristas from that brew log that we saw from before, which is symbolized here on the mobile view, to tie brews, brew references to roast batches in, if you're lucky and use crops to roast, then it can be tied to the actual roast and roast curve in the most um, rudimentary form. Uh, one can add um, roast batch IDs from external providers or uh, roast dates but um, using that ideal case here, it allows a barista to immediately go into the roast information and what is symbolized here by the roast curve, you know, scrolling up and down on this uh, static screen here would show the barista cupping notes, um, would show um, how dark the coffee was roasted, would show um, potentially some hints on how it extracts based on um, how long it was or, or, or end temperature, density of the coffee, all these type of variables that narrow it down, um, comments and um, basically fact-based exchanges to understand how to uh, use and manipulate this coffee then going forward. 
and um, we don't want to let the roasters down either. So the same thing is true for roasters, then they might benefit from understanding how that coffee is being brewed in individual locations. And so uh, the users of our roast solution will very well know our roast compare report where the brew references will then appear. And so it is then on one view, how was the coffee being roasted and cupped in a standardized way? Um, and then how it extracts and how it tastes in a certain brewing method. And it just creates this, I would say, um, yeah, space for um, conversation based on facts uh, rather, than, rather than starting the conversation on, do you have any tips? The conversation can start on, hey, I saw you roasted it that way. Therefore, this is how I went for it. And it was more easy for me to dial this coffee in and extract it. Um, and so this is what I found, which you can see here. And hopefully this helps you uh, keeping the roast profile vibrant for this coffee going forward. Now we've uh, arrived uh, over an hour in at the end of our uh, lovely little webinar. It is, um, it is always exciting how much one can talk about the exciting coffee world and uh, it's never enough to speak about it. Um, at this point, uh, if there are any questions, we are welcoming them. Um, if not, that is also fine. Um, viewers, dear audience, uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed our, our little chat here. If you wanna scan this code or go to our website or just send us a message, then uh, we can either pick up your questions or give you a demonstration. Um, when we say demonstration, we usually wanna start by what is key and what is important in your business of the things that we've touched today. Um, maybe some of the things don't uh, apply so much to your business and others do more. Uh, we wanna know this and we wanna make sure that Crops to Cafe fits your workflows. And um, the more we can understand, as always, the better and easier we can move our solution forward. So Isa is nodding her head heavily here. Um, and so I, um, yeah, no, I, I don't see any questions right now. It means we've been pretty comprehensive, but again, the invitation, do contact us. Um, um, at Cropster, use any email address or uh, the website and you will find us and we are happy to get back. I want to say thank you, particularly uh, Eline and Isa. It was a pleasure. I think it was a very, very good conversation. Um, I learned along presenting and that is always a great use of my time and of everybody else's and I hope uh, our audience learned as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for everybody.